we established at the beginning. So uh, the annotations are rather ad hoc. Uh, to extend this work, we looked at 20 articles selected from this corpus, and we tried to do a more thorough um, evalu um, annotation, sorry. Um, and we set up an annotation guide, and then we had the two groups of experts that uh, independently uh, did their uh, did the annotation on these articles, and then there was a consensus established. And of course, we want to expand this corpus to um, to cover at least a few hundred articles. And in this um, slide, uh, I describe a little bit an entity linking approach, very basic, uh, that we put in place to see if we can link the mentions of uh, foods in articles uh, with foods uh, that are described in food on. So the approach is uh, uh, starts by matching strings uh, with, or with labels from the food on ontology. Uh, we also had a look at UMLS synonyms to, to find the different ways of describing the same concept. Uh, we look at the different uh, other synonyms uh, that we, we can find. Um, to describe the same concept. So some of these are has synonym or has exact synonym, has related synonym relations. And then uh, we found out that some of the concepts actually are uh, composed phrases in food on. So we have uh, the name of the food and then food product. So for instance, uh, orange food product. And then we had other expressions that, that form composed phrases for the labels in, in food on. Uh, we looked at uh, removing plurals, uh, upper lower casing, also removing special characters uh, from the names of uh, foods uh, described in scientific articles. So uh, here are some of our findings. Um, the, the automated approach did not work very well. So we only managed to cover about 62% of the foods described in the articles and 76% uh, of the uh, food components. So chemical substances contained in food. Um, and we looked um, at manually matching these um, uh, instances of food that we were not able to match directly. In some cases, we had uh, missing food categories. For instance, green vegetables is a concept that is not represented currently in food on. And then um, the fact that we have composed phrases in food on uh, causes sometimes problems because um, ideally, we wanted to, to map to the um, basic food, so food products, uh, but this is not available for all the foods. So sometimes we have other uh, composed phrases that contain um, the things like whole or raw or cooked or processed. Uh, this is hard to, to, to do uh, automatically, and even sometimes they are available at the same time. We have food products available, and then also, um, for instance, orange or whole and raw. Um, then, uh, for instance, uh, the, on, another inconsistency is the fact that we don't have juice available for all the foods. So we have for certain foods, but not for corn grenades. Uh, then green tea is available as a product or so dry, but not as a beverage in food on. Um, and then other cases that are missing are um, related to scientific names or uh, very specific labels, and also the fact that in scientific articles we can have more uh, composed phrases like frozen grape juice or uh, brew tea. And this is a question if we would like to see this represented in ontology, or rather we would like to uh, separate and represent separately, you know, the grape juice uh, food product and then uh, frozen as just the um, way this uh, food is uh, processed. So we did the um, to, um, to address the problem of missing categories, we did some work uh, on uh, finding these from Wikipedia, and this is the topic of a different um, article. And I will skip through this and uh, jump straight to the conclusions. Um, so we did the ontology design for of food drug interactions in the feed ontology, and we did some evaluation of entity linking with food on, where we found uh, several um, categories missing and also inconsistencies in the way uh, foods are represented um, in food on. And as future work, we plan to, uh, to detail a lot more the interaction mechanisms using the interaction network ontology in. So thank you for all your attention. I would be happy to take some questions afterwards. Right. Thanks, Georgetta. Uh, so what I've done in terms of questions is created a Google Doc um, in the um, chat 
uh, if it's not showing there, I'll just add add the link. Um, what we thought we would do to make it more of a interplay discussion between ontology uh, ontologies is to save the questions um, for the next hour. So um, that leads us to move on to the next presentation uh, by Paul Castellano. And I will give Paul's intro. Um, we're trying to keep it to about 10 minutes per show. I'll stick this one minute tag on when, uh, when we're getting close. So hey, great. Paul, uh, Paul brings uh, a bachelor's in biology at the University of Barcelona, 2016, and a master's in bioinformatics and biostatistics at the U University of Barcelona and Open in University of Catalonia. He focuses on the identification of epigenetic and metabolomic markers in childhood obesity. He's doing his PhD at the Our Markers and Nutritional Food Metabolomics Lab <clears throat> and in the Statistics and Bioinformatics Lab at the University of Barcelona. Lately, his research has been focused on food metabolomics data analysis, developing new tools for this data and discovering the huge and interesting field of ontologies. Over to you, Paul. Okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, yes we can. Yeah? Okay. The whole, yep, the whole slide is good. Okay, great. So thanks for the introduction, Damien. Uh, I'm Paul Castellano and I'm doing my PhD in biostatistics and bioinformatics at the University of Barcelona. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the food biomarker ontology or FOBI. FOBI is an ontology that represents metabolites or compounds, foods and their relationships. So let's go, but first of all, I would like to introduce two important concepts to understand the, the, the aim of, of FOBI. So the first one is what's metabolomics? Metabolomics is the identification and quantification of the small molecule metabolic product of a biological system. So all these metabolites form the metabolome and the two most used methods for metabolome profiling are the mass spectrometry and NMR. We can see in the figure that in the omics cascade, metabolomics is the, is the last layer because metabolites are formed by the protein reactions and proteins are the product of RNA and so on. Uh, and the second one is the, the food metabolome. What is the, the food metabolome? So the food metabolome is the part of the human metabolome that directly derived from, from diet. And this part of the metabolome is in what we are more interested. However, uh, humans have other metabolome sources as endogenous metabolites, uh, drugs, or, or pollutants. Okay, uh, let's proceed with our lab scenario or, or yeah, our group scenario. We work both with nutritional and, and metabolomic data, trying to find patterns and trying to associate both of, of them, these, these two types of data. But however, we have to face with different problems in, in this process. The first one is the heterogeneity of the nutritional data. Often nutritional data use uh, different terms to, to define the, the same thing. And this is basically a semantic error problem and food on can provide us a, a resource to, to deal with, with this. The second one is the, the difficult association um, between nutritional data and other types of data, metabolomics, uh, metabolomics in, in our case. So this is not only a semantic problem, it's also a quantitative problem because sometimes nutritional data is collected in a more qualitative way and it becomes difficult to associate it with quantitative, uh, quantitative data like metabolomics. And finally, the most important problem uh, is that the relationships between foods and metabolites are still unclear in the nutri-metabolomics community. Uh, there are a lot of information in different databases about, about it, about these relationships between foods and metabolites, but there is, uh, there is a consensus yet. So, uh, our aim when we start this, this project, so uh, our, our aim was to create an ontology that clearly defines the many complex, uh, complex relationships between diet-derived metabolites and foods in a consistent and, and homogeneous way. Uh, as the second one is to reuse the previous existing terms to maintain a consistent and standardized nomenclature using different OBA foundry ontologies like Fudon or Kedi and other ontologies. And the first and the last one is to propose a consistent starting point for nutrimetabolomic studies, both for the design and for the validation of, of these experiments or, 
or these studies. Okay, we have created the, the phobia ontology to define the relationships between foods and, and metabolites or compounds. At the right side of this slide, we can see a, a plot of full phobi colored by different properties that I will explain at the next slide. And some methods about phobia is that uh, phobia is composed by two independent but interconnected subontologies. Phobia contains a total of 1097 terms four different properties, third, uh, 13 foot top level classes, 11 biomarker top level classes, almost, uh, almost 5,000 relationships. Fobi now is part of Boba Foundry. And this is very important, I think, because the Fobi IDs are already indexed in other important databases as human metabolome database or, or food database. Okay, let's proceed to talk about the, the two Fobi subontologies. Sub the first one is the, is the food subontology that defines the relationship between foods, both raw and multi-component foods. The structure of this ontology is in major part adopted from food database and is composed by uh, 350 terms and almost 90% of terms are adopted from, from food on. On the other side, uh, biomarker subontology defines the relationships between compounds and their chemical classes. The structure of this subontology is adopted from the chemical functional ontology and, and it's composed by 850 terms. Uh, in this case, only 20% is adopted from, from chem. So we have seen that food subontology terms are basically covered by food on, but only a 20% of biomarker subontology is covered by chem. This is because chem doesn't have much diet related metabolites and it's transformation by human metabolism or microbiota. Fobi is basically made of, of these diet transformed compounds and not only by the compounds that are in, uh, present in the nature of, nature of different, different foods. Finally, Fobi has four different properties, uh, biomarker of and has biomarker to connect food and biomarker subontologies and contains and is ingredient of to connect raw and multi-component foods within the food subontology. Okay. This is an, an example of FOBI architecture, this uh, FOBI structure. Here we have used the, the term apple that is adopted from, from food on. At the left side, we can see the food subontology, while at the right side, we can see the, the biomarker ontology. As I commented before, both subontologies are independent but, but connected by different terms. In, in this example, apple is part of food subontology but connected with biomarker ontology by yellow lines which indicate that the apple is biomarker of fluoridine, for example, and another compound. However, this second compound is also biomarker of tea and cacao, and not, uh, not only uh, an apple biomarker. So at the left side, in this slide, we can see that the multicombinant foods are connected with raw food by orange lines, indicating that apple pie, for example, contains apple and apple, at the same time, is ingredient of apple pie. Okay. Uh, finally, we have developed two, two applications to fa facilitate and extend the use of FOBI to the community. The first one is the is FOBI tools. FOBI tools now is in beta version, but it's an R package that provides, uh, provides users some FOBI applications like over representation analysis or automatic free notational text notation by using different text mining, text mining approaches. So let me give you an example of overrepresentation analysis in, in FOBI. Overrepresentation analysis is a common method used in genomics, for example, to explore the biological significance of different list of genes resulting from, the, from different studies or experiments. Often this method uh, provides users the association between a list of genes and, and different biological pathways. But in the case of FOBI, the background information is not about genes and pathways. In the FOBI, uh, inf the FOBI information is about uh, food or food groups and different metabolites. Then FOBI tools, the, this tool we have created, gives users the, uh, the association between a list of different lists of metabolites and the corresponding overrepresented groups of food gro or, or food groups using the FOBI relationships. And the second one is the FOBI visualization tool. This is a graphical user interface uh, tool that we have created to explore FOBI both in graph and table formats. User can query by different terms and, and properties to explore the relationships between, between foods and metabolites or within foods or within metabolites and download the results in a, in a plot or table, table format. 
So I would like to acknowledge the, the groups or the labs where I work, the statistical and bioinformatics research group and the biomarkers and nutritional and food metabolomics research group from the University of Barcelona. And for sure to Damien Dole for his help in the integration of food on and, and KB into, into FODI. And thank you all and absolutely welcome to, to contribute or collaborate. Great. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, it was a real pleasure working uh, with you on um, on the Obo Foundry integration. Thanks. Okay. Uh, uh, next up, we will have Francesco Vitali, and I have a little intro for him. Uh, so, Francesco has a background and PhD in microbiology and bioinformatics. He leads the metagenomic data analysis in projects dealing with microbiota in human health and disease and its interaction with nutrition. He got involved in ontology four years ago when he became one of the main ontology for nutritional studies developers. And that sparked an interest in the modeling of reality through ontology and the ontological representation of human nutrition information, work which is also influenced by his microbiology and bioinformatics background. So with that, uh, I think you've got sh screen sharing. Yeah, we see your slides. Okay. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for the introduction and good evening or good afternoon or good morning to everyone based on where you are. I'm Francesco Vitali and uh, today I will, I will talk to you about uh, the ontology we developed, the ontology for nutritional studies, uh, acronym ONS, and some of the, its uh, recent and future direction. So some, uh, uh, I don't know if you can see well. Okay, some... Uh, introduction okay can you see well my screen right okay the the ons the ontology was developed in the context of the empadasi project which is an european project uh, with the aim of uh, uh, being a way of harmonization between uh, metadata in uh, um, stored uh, in two databases one is the uh, for intervention studies and one for observation studies and as a way for to perform federated analysis. Uh, from this initial, uh, uh, let's say, application-oriented uh, uh, development, uh, we aim at uh, uh, enlarging our audience and to include uh, also a lot of terms and uh, schema uh, of for the nutritional community more in general. The ontology was uh, uh, published two years ago and it was uh, uh, developed following the OBO Foundry principles. Uh, now it, it is also included in the OBO Foundry repository. So as such, uh, it has the basic formal ontology at top level uh, classes. Then we import uh, a series of terms from the OBI ontology and uh, a lot of terms from various uh, other ontologies at the domain level. Uh, what you can see here, it's an overall uh, schema of uh, the ontology, the ONS, in the part dealing with uh, diet, nutrition, and food uh, concept, which were considered central for, uh, uh, let's say, talking about nutrition and nutrition studies uh, and nutrition sciences in uh, general. In particular, um, in ONS, we define the diet uh, not as something uh, uh, predetermined or fixed, but rather as something uh, coming out from uh, a certain uh, pattern. So the, um, what a person or a group is eating uh, during meals in a defined time period defines a certain dietary pattern, which ultimately defines the diet that person or group is following. I'm focusing on this part because this was uh, uh, the part that recently got some uh, uh, work and some improvement. We were, uh, uh, we have been collaborating in the Joint Food Ontology Work Group uh, as other ontologies uh, also seen today. And uh, uh, those terms about the diet were some uh, among the hot topics, let's say, in the issue tracker of the, of the repository. As a result of this interaction, uh, the 
that the, the, let's say the idea behind uh, that, that was uh, formalized in uh, ONS uh, of defining the diet uh, as some sort of dietary pattern has uh, remained. And as a result of this uh, interaction and revision of term, uh, 63 uh, classes were added uh, or will be added to NS, uh, defining the dietary pattern, so the diet for our uh, formalization, um, as different flavors uh, of uh, how uh, one can see the diet concept. So for example, some terms, uh, here I'm reporting only the higher level of this uh, hierarchy, some terms uh, are, uh, um, let's say, define the diet and see the diet through the biological capability of a species, for example. So we can say that the a felin is a carnivore or homo sapiens can be considered biologically uh, an omnivore. And then we have other way of looking at the diet, for example, uh, by the type of food uh, included. So for example, uh, uh, the vegan diet would be a diet by food organism with, uh, uh, which excludes all animal products. And, uh, uh, and so on with various flavors of uh, these uh, various way of seeing this concept. In ONS to uh, move forward, uh, we are more or less interested in the uh, schema I am uh, uh, representing here. So we are interested in the axis going from the ingredients uh, uh, through the transformation that happens both biological and non-biological during food preparation, let's say, to the food and the bioactive, which are finally consumed by the human, the, 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 the human body, and uh, uh, transformed uh, by the human, the host, or the, by the microbiota to have final uh, health uh, consequence. In particular, to starting to explore this, uh, this axis, uh, this, this schema, we started to uh, model what, uh, what is a fermentation. And uh, among the fermentation, among the various fermentation uh, product, we choose the kefir, as it is one of the one of the most widely diffused product. It has a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, literature, and there are a lot of known health benefit uh, uh, of its consumption. So here I'm reporting uh, uh, a schema again in the context of uh, ONS of what uh, uh, the kefir fermentation, uh, how the kefir fermentation can be modeled. And the, 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 red, uh, the red rectangle uh, uh, will zoom on one of the first, uh, let's say, difficult part we encountered. Uh, we started by modeling how the fermentation uh, can start uh, and uh, in kefir classically the fermentation is started by adding the kefir grains. The problem was that the kefir grains uh, are originated and formed during kefir fermentation. So we encountered the uh, chicken and egg problems and to solve it we create uh, some other classes uh, detailing uh, uh, in the first instance, what is uh, the starter culture? So uh, this is a class uh, uh, defined defined as the uh, the actual microbiota, the actual community performing fermentation. And what is an inoculum for fermentation, which is more the vehicle, uh, the carrier for this uh, starter culture. And in the, with the, the addition of those classes, the kefir grain, which uh, can be defined as uh, having two active ingredients. One is kefirin, which is a polysaccharide making a scaffold to form the grain. And the other one is the actual uh, uh, kefir microbiota, which grows uh, and get cows uh, in this uh, scaffold. Um, so we can say that the kefir fermentation starts uh, at some point in time with a starter culture. So with a inoculum, uh, not, not an inoculum of a starter culture. And uh, as a result, the kefir grain are formed those kefir grain can be recovered and can be used again as inoculum for other fermentations. As I was saying, the kefir grain have two active parts, and one is the, obviously the kefir microbiota, which is the one performing the fermentation. So the kefir microbiota and the fermentation occurring into kefir can 
were, were modeled and can be uh, divided into two main type of fermentation because there are a lot of uh, things going on during uh, kefir fermentation. From one side, uh, we have the lactic, uh, lactose uh, uh, fermentation to lactic acid by the lactic acid bacteria. From the other side, we have the ethanol fermentation of glucose by the yeast. Um, so we divided the uh, lactic acid fermentation into various steps, uh, which are casually linked uh, between them. But apart from this uh, schema and various parts of the fermentation, um, what I want to point out here is the connection between the uh, bacteria and the microbiota functioning, the microbiota fermentation and product, the final kefir product uh, uh, characteristic. For example, lactose during fermentation is degraded and uh, the kefir has a low lactose content. So the instance of uh, lactose concentration in kefir is related to uh, lactose intolerance in a positive sense. So intolerant people, lactose intolerant people can consume kefir because there is uh, low lactose. On the other side, the other three main products are uh, lactic acid, CO2 and ethanol, which uh, are, uh, or to better say, the, the instance of their concentration in the kefir is connected to the preservation of the kefir and to the sensory, the, the taste of the kefir. And I would like to, to thank uh, the, the people which uh, uh, participated in this, uh, uh, in this work. Uh, so Agnese and Professor Cavalieri from the University of Florence, Emily, Paola and Chiara from the Council for Agricultural Research and Economics and uh, you for the attention. Great, Paul. Uh, thanks very much for that. And uh, I have a couple of questions for you, which I will also save for the, um, for the question. Uh, okay, so the uh, next last uh, slide, well, not last slide presentation, but the next presentation uh, is from, West from Chen Yang, talking about the ontology for nutritional epidemiology. He comes with a master's degree in human nutrition science in 2015. Uh, he's a PhD student now working on the development and application of ontologies in nutritional epidemiologic research. Chen notes that diet related chronic diseases present a global challenge, especially with vulnerable populations in low and middle income countries. So his focus has been on research towards healthier and more balanced diets, including the collection and integration of food intake data and ways to increase nutrition research quality and capacity. So he appreciates presenting his group's findings here in the context of a transdisciplinary discussion with experts in food, nutrition, and computer science. So with that, um, I hand it over to you, Chen, and I see your slide right now shared. Okay, yeah, thank you very much um, for the introduction. Um, uh, hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, share our ontology to you and uh, to get your comments on it. Today I would present the ontology that was created by our, uh, by our uh, research group. It's called the Ontology for Nutritional Epidemiology, the current achievements and the future perspectives. Yeah. First of all, I would like to uh, uh, briefly define what is nutritional epidemiology. Uh, in one sentence, nutritional epidemiology is a uh, subject to, uh, to explore the relationship between food and health problems, whether the food would give uh, positive effects, if positive influence on the health problems. Uh, this is the uh, central topic in nutritional epidemiology. So in case, uh, uh, so if we want to do the nutritional ep epidemiological research, the most important thing is that we need to collect different kinds of information. So here I used uh, data, information, knowledge, and wisdom pyramid to classify the information that we require uh, to do nutritional epidemiological research because the DIKW pyramid is a uh, pyramid has been used in uh, computer science and information science for
for several years. So I thought this would be a good step before we start making the ontologies. So here you can see in uh, nutritional epidemiology, we need uh, uh, data information knowledge and wisdom, four levels of information. For the data, we need the data intake data, the anthropometry data, sociodemographic data, physical activity data, biomarker data, et cetera, et cetera. Different kinds of data need to be collected. And for the information level, they contain uh, it contains the observational or intervention study designs as well as the result and uh, maybe background and discussions. And the knowledge level information is the, uh, is the conclusion of different research, uh, which is a diet health status relationship. And from the knowledge or from the conclusion of research, we can generate dietary guidelines or nutrition policies, which is uh, considered as wisdom information in uh, nutritional epidemiology. So after the classification of the information, we decided to uh, make the ontology uh, for a computer to process the information in nutritional epidemiology to promote the data share and data reuse in this field. So in 2019, we create an ontology to standardize the research output of nutritional epidemiology from paper-based standards to link content. As the first version of the ontology, we introduced 79 new classes to annotate data sets and 24 new classes to annotate manuscripts. And in the first version of the ontology, ONE, we have different kinds of terms or different kinds of classes, uh, we, it, which include uh, the terms or classes uh, regarding study designs and reportings uh, in nutritional epidemiology. At the same time, we also include classes about the dietary assessment method based on service, and also classes about anthropometry measurements methods based on service. So before the development, we also did a literature review on the existing standards. Uh, and we also develop standards by ourselves or refer others standards. And finally, at the first attempt, we include three lists of, uh, of terms from uh, existing standards. The first is the stroke nut standards, which is uh, a list of terms uh, aims at improving reporting of uh, observational studies with a focus on diet and health. And we also include two lists of terms regarding the data quality and the minimum data information. And from the 2019, we start to explore how to apply our ontology. So there are two papers published as conference paper uh, of uh, IEEE Big Data 2019, and another paper was published uh, uh, on the journal Advances in Nutrition. And uh, yeah, the first paper is about how to use ONE as well as other food relevant, uh, food, other relevant food ontologies to represent the nutritional epidemiology. And the second paper was about how to use uh, uh, ONE to automate the tracking of content and evidence appraisal of nutrition research. So uh, as I mentioned before, we classified information used in the nutritional epidemiology. And uh, as the next step uh, in this case study, we uh, try to identify the existing ontologies that can be used to represent the information in nutritional epidemiology. Because we do believe we don't have to create all the terms by ourselves. The most important thing is to identify the existing terms and try to find the, the missing terms and include, and include them in our ontology. So here uh, you see on different levels of uh, information, for different levels of information, we, recognize, we identify different existing ontologies. For the data level, uh, 
the food ontology, the food biomarker ontology, the oval relations ontology, the human disease ontology, and ontology for food studies can be used to annotate nutritional epidemiological study. At the same time, the food ontology and human disease ontology can be also to clarify, uh, used to clarify the relationship between uh, food, uh, diet, and the disease on the knowledge level. However, for the information and wisdom level, we have to use our ontology, and this is uh, our current work and uh, future work to, uh, to finalize the dis description and to improve uh, the representation of knowledge in this field. This is also the reason that I joined this uh, workshop, because I think the harmonization of ontology is very important, and uh, the cooperation between between different groups is uh, very important uh, for each subject to uh, improve the data reuse and data share. So I would like to uh, collaborate with uh, all the food relevant, uh, food, all the ontologies, uh, all the food relevant ontologies groups. And uh, we are also glad to uh, give support if you feel that we contains uh, our ontology contain the contain the terms that uh, you required um, okay we also create some uh, some tools uh, to, uh, to facilitate the, the generation of ontology first of all we create a web crawler to uh, extract information from a web page and to convert those information automatically automatically into a knowledge graph Secondly, we also work on a Python model to try to uh, annotate uh, the uh, uh, research papers and uh, try to visualize the statistic of reporting completeness of papers based on our ontology. In the future, uh, there are a, a few things that we need to uh, achieve. Uh, by the end of this year, we are going to release a new version of ONE because we just recognize that the regular update of ONE is very necessary and we will keep doing that uh, regularly. And uh, at the same time, we would work with, uh, uh, I mean, we would uh, ask for suggestions from other ontology in initiative like Food on ONS as well as other food and nutrition ontologies to see how we can uh, harmonize our ontology and uh, let it be used uh, uh, in other ontologies to try to uh, yeah, contribute to the uh, joint uh, food ontology initiative. And uh, at the same time, ONE will also be involved according to the Obo Foundry rules and try to be a member of Obo Foundry. And finally, we are also going to introduce new application of ONE uh, in the next few years, we are going to annotate dietary guidelines and uh, nutrition policies and to see how to organize the uh, knowledge representation as, and the statistic analysis. Finally, I would like to say that the basic knowledge regarding the use of ontologies, open science and fair data need to be integrated in the curriculum of students and researchers. We really believe that we need more people, more nutrition researchers to, uh, to know what is ontology and then try to apply ontology. So we also have big interests to, uh, to, to uh, a big interest about uh, relevant training or education of ontology in nutrition program. So we are also welcome, we also welcome the, this kinds of uh, collaboration uh, 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 worldwide because uh, in Genty University currently we have a master program and uh, my supervisor, Professor, uh, Professor Karl Aschert, uh, is really uh, interested in uh, uh, such kinds of training or, or, or lectures or even courses organized in the master program. I think it would be uh, uh, a nice idea and I'm looking forward to um, we are looking forward to such uh, collaboration if it's uh, possible. Okay, thank you very much. That's all what I want to present today. Great, thank you, Chen. And I uh, really look forward to working uh, more with you and on, on one end, really uh, appreciating uh, this um, reaching out of the ontology community into the fair data space of annotating uh, papers and knowledge out there. Yeah ontologies like yours. 
And that brings us to um, the very last um, presentation and inter in interactive, um, eventually interactive presentation, which is from Trini Naravani. Trini is pursuing a PhD program at UC Davis in biological and agricultural engineering. Her thesis includes machine learning methods to predict health and flavor properties of foods. She is a chef, a past chef, but once a chef, always a chef, and has a graduate degree in computer science. And she's motivated by her passion of food, for food and works to find various channels to interact with consumers about their food preferences and dietary needs. <clears throat> Today, she and her sister, Ekta Parpia, am I pronouncing that? I hope, Parpia, will present on the sensory part of the workshop. And uh, we are doing something no other workshop has done at uh, Joe Wo, which is uh, package this sensory experience. I'm really excited to, to hear about this. Tarini. I can see your slide, um, but I don't have audio from you. Still no audio. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Damien. Okay, great. Okay. So you have a small laptop screen, so I have to hunt sometimes for when the menus hide themselves. Well, um, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you for those in the Far East for staying up at night. Normally, we would be in wonderful Bolsano, and um, a sensory experience is usually something you do in person where everyone gets together. It's a common part of also having a, a food eating experience that you all are together in it. But we have to do the best we can now with the current situation. So the idea of this is that we can also um, know about food through the practice of eating the food um, besides listening to all these formative uh, presentations. Um, so this is organized by my sister and I, and we've often done a lot of cooking together. So we share a lot of very similar thoughts and we, um, about food and food perception, and we come at it in slightly different ways. I'm currently um, pursuing scientific exploration of food perception and why this is important. Uh, previously, of course, it brings together my, my practical experience of having cooked um, and I've worked as a computer scientist, I have a degree as a computer scientist, so I like to think of this from a data perspective as well. My sister is a bacon confectioner and she specialized in personalized orders for um, over a decade. Sensory perception is a very complicated science and a complicated experience. It is about how you can distinguish and identify the various smells, tastes, and textures in food. This drives a response of liking or disliking your food or of satisfaction. And it's these responses that drive repeat purchases of the food. So um, what makes consumers react this way? In a very simple and obvious way, it has to do with the product itself. A sweet product is always going to taste sweet and a fruit is going to taste fruity. Yeah, in different extents, but it's fairly obvious. Then there's some marketing related information about the quality, which is such as the freshness or the nutrition quality of the food, which might, which may not be tasteable, but it does affect your perception. Then it gets a little bit more complicated. It has to do with the physiology or the psychology of the consumer, the mood you're in, the memories the food evokes. If it's been a past favorable experience, you might tend to like the food more. Um, on the other hand, if you've had a food poisoning um, um, experience with that food, then you may, you may be averse to it. Your health at the time also matters. We all know that when we have a flu or a cold, um, we are immediately drawn towards eating certain foods and other foods, we can hardly even smell them. And if we can, they just don't smell pleasant anymore. Finally, and this is the most external um, condition, but it has a huge impact. It has to do with the context. This could be a physical location where you are. Um, for instance, when I'm in France, French cheese seems to taste different than when I'm not. 
or coffee in Italy, I'm sure is better, but the experience is always more fantastic than anywhere else. Um, social situations matter. Are you eating alone? Are you eating with friends? Are you eating a sandwich in front of your TV, um, in front of your uh, computer screen? Um, the time of day matters. Um, pressures matter. If you're studying for an exam, you might be drawn to eating certain foods. So this makes us look at the situation today. How has the pandemic changed uh, the way we consume food? Has it introduced additional factors? Does many of us now resort to home cooking because the businesses where we could reliably always pick up food are not available anymore? Um, well, they are now recently, but for a long time, when the uh, um, pandemic first started um, around March, um, home cooking started to have a big influence. Um, and then there is the ability to also personalize food, um, which has is, which is started growing. Um, but recently, the pandemic also raises certain health concerns. We want to eat more nutritious food. We want to have immune systems. Maybe our ability to exercise has been limited by going outside, which again draws our attention to eating more nutritious food. So we're going to consider these additional factors in the experience that we have designed for you. Um, my sister will now continue. Thank you, Tarani. Uh, hello, everyone. For this event, we've picked banana bread. It seems to have become the unofficial baked good of the pandemic. It was amongst the top three trends during the COVID lockdown, along with sourdough and Dalgona coffee. But honestly, there is no replacement to an espresso. <laughs> so the last time that banana bread was this popular was during the 1930s, the Great Depression. So there seems to be some timelessness about it. But there's also a very logical explanation to this trend, if we'd like to call it that, because bananas are easily accessible, available regardless of the season. And at a time like this, at this pandemic, I mean, every household wants to avoid wastage and what better than to use overripe bananas. Banana bread as a food for many has a nostalgic family connection. And given the current situation when people can't see their loved ones, Childhood nostalgia is at a high. Next slide. Yeah, so for this, um, this one bowl banana bread recipe is very easy to make and a wooden spoon and bowl is all that's needed. It also allows for substitutions. I'll point out a few substitutions that you can use. Uh, we've used vegetable oil, but you could use avocado or olive oil. We use Coconut sugar, you could use brown sugar. We've put in walnuts, pecans will work just as well. Or you could even use seeds like pumpkin, flax seeds, sunflower seeds. Uh, dark chocolate is what we preferred using, but you could use milk or white chocolate. And if you want to avoid chocolate completely, you could use raisins and cranberries. Now this recipe is an adaptation from Nigella Lawson. Uh, we use a weighing scale for this recipe, but it can also be done with a cup measure. And that's available on Nigella's website. And the link to her website is available in the email. Next slide, please. Uh, the baking part of this workshop will be followed by two questionnaires. One questionnaire will be about your overall experience. And the second one will be a comparison between what you've baked and the one that you purchase. Next slide, please. Okay, now this is the schedule of the baking exercise and the questionnaire. Uh, please do send in your completed forms by the 27th or the 28th. We will compile and send the results to you by the 7th of October. Uh, but most importantly, I'd like to point out that uh, the first time that you taste the uh, banana bread is also when you do the tasting exercise. And the reason for this is because we don't want any prior conditioning to affect the results. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we've also included an instructional video in the email. So if you do have any additional questions regarding the ingredients or baking techniques, please feel free to email us. And if also you haven't received the email, let us know and we'll send that to you. 
Thank you everyone for participating. We really hope you enjoy this baking exercise. Thank you, Damien and the committee for organizing the workshop. Great, and thank you both uh, for livening up this experience. And I'm really looking forward to cooking this. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm curious about how many others are, are, uh, are getting, their, getting their shopping lists ready um, to, uh, to go out and do the same. Um, we're going to take a 10 minute break now and then we can dive into a multidisciplinary discussion about uh, everything we've covered uh, so far this morning. So that means um, it looks like we'll need to be back at about uh, a little after, quarter after seven in the morning. And I'll just put the video on pause and um, uh, please go to the question sheet to add questions or we can just do a more interactive discussion. It's meant to pitch questions at people, but also to uh, start to have ontologists um, make requests of each other, even like, what do I need out of your ontology? What do you need out of mine? So looking forward to that part. And um, so we'll meet at, uh, I guess, 17 after 7 again. OK, thanks. Okay, I think we can start up soon uh, with, within a minute or so. Okay, okay so um, we're gathered here again. And um, there are questions in the workshop um, uh, question page. And um, of course, people presented linearly. And uh, just to get things started, I'll start some questions linearly in that order. But um, I think it's a discussion to uh, share amongst all presenters. So that said. Um, uh, first of all, does anybody else want to lead the way? If not, I will. Um, I'll pick a few. Okay, I'll start up. So um, this one is to Georgetta Bordia regarding Fideo. Um, we, I am very conscious that um, Fudon is still evolving and that's why we're sort of still a 0.4 ontology instead of a 1.0 ontology. Um, but in your eyes, what would be the one or two priorities for uh, enabling food on to help you better to cover, to get that coverage of food above 70% in the papers um, you were annotating? That's the basic question I have for you. The, the main thing that we, um, the, main, the main thing that I wrote I there and uh, we noticed in the study is that um, and, and we're sure there are good reasons for that, but uh, for us it would be so much more easy if you have them. Um, as the rule, you would have a list of good products for each of the food items. So whenever there's a, an orange or an apple, you'd have an orange food product and an apple food product item, because it's easy enough to find that then when you have to go to the ontology and then decide whether this is raw or whole or cooked is not is not always um, uh, information that we have uh, in the scientific article. So it would be good to be able to refer to the generic food product of each food item. Mm -hmm. um, and then if, if we have the information, we could actually specialize more. And then, uh, so I, I do realize that some of these um, qualifications are there for disambiguation purposes. But um, it it would it would go along we would go a much more longer way if we would be able to to create this automatically so to take the food item from the text and then just add food product and find it in food on uh, for for all the food products yeah okay so audio is breaking up a little bit there but um, the idea that um, uh, well first of all the uh, the chemical food chemical interactions. I presume the papers mostly focus on single ingredient foods. Is that right? 
uh, in, in your world, or are they saying, <laughs> are they? Yes, often is the case, yeah. Okay, often so. Often that is the case, yeah. Most often that is the case. Okay, so I can see uh, creating um, a set of facets such as raw, cooked, um, and um, sliced or otherwise processed. Um, I guess I can follow up with you later about exactly which processes you're finding uh, in the papers that um, need need terminology coverage or the different um, variations of a basic raw food. Okay. Um, okay. <clears throat> yeah, that, that'll be very good. And then. Uh, yeah. Right. And you mentioned one mm -hmm. thing, which was uh, relation between food component and ingredient. Um, and I presume that includes chemicals and additives and things like that. Um, so um, I think that merits a bit of a discussion over on the um, over in the integrated food ontology work group um, GitHub site. So I'll open up an issue about that. I think it's a connected to um, a recipe model that we're starting to develop there. Um, Foodon doesn't have a recipe model of ingredients and. Uh, processes for putting something together so and not in the Obo foundry uh, ontology space either does such a thing exist so um, we're very interested in putting that um, okay other questions for um, Georgetta about Fideo and the chemical food interaction there's um, there is one question from Handy. Uh, did you get a chance to look at FDA's adverse effects database? And she offers another acronym, AMA. I'm not sure what AMA stands for. It's the European Med Medicine Agency or something like that. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, it's, it, the adverse effects database is not always very clear or well kept, but I was just wondering if they got a chance to look at it at all. It, it's a very good suggestion and no we haven't yet so um, food drug interactions are a, a type of adverse uh, drug effects so then yeah it's a, it's a very sensible suggestion to check if uh, this is covered uh, already or to what extent it is covered in the adverse um, drug event databases okay other questions for georgetta and Fideo. All right, we'll start up with um, with uh, uh, phobi uh, things that address phobi and Paul. Um, I believe I saw on one of your slides you mentioned an automatic nutritional text annotation, which sounded very interesting, but I uh, I didn't quite catch whether you covered that in your slide presentation or not. And, what that what that is yeah uh can you hear me yeah right. yep yeah so uh, sure uh the, this tool i comment uh, the, is called the phobi tool includes an automatic nutritional text annotation function that is based on different text mining methods so basically uh regular expression etc so many times when when collecting nutritional information either either in for example the dietary goals or ffqs uh, the, the, these two different formats. Uh, nutritional records are very uh, heterogeneous and often do not use an unified identifier. So if researchers are saying this one to know quite, uh, quickly to which stem of phobia or food on each element of this questionnaire corresponds, they can use this tool. So this tool supports free text uh, like sentences, words, or entire paragraphs and returns the corresponding name and identifiers Within within phobi, that uh, for nutritional entities is a major part of these items are from adopted from food on. So in this way, uh, we can quickly get the metabolites that corresponds to a poorly labeled nutritional record. Um, so I was curious. So it's looking at the terms, uh, and you're saying it's using. Is it just drawing upon phobi's knowledge of um, chemical? Um, chemicals and food products, or is it uh, re reaching into other ontologies to do this work? Can, uh, can, can you repeat this, sorry? 
Right. I can't um, hear you. I can hear you. So what? Sorry. I'll, I'll just Come. turn my video. Off. Maybe that'll help. Um, just wondering if <clears throat> your it sounds like it's a text mining application that looks for ontology labels and synonyms in free text for identifying chemicals and food items. Is that right? No, uh, it's not for chemicals. It's only for, for nutritional items. Okay. This application is, uh, only applies to nutritional, nutritional fields. And basically, it not... Uh, it, it checks the plurals, the, the singulars of these, these forms or, or few uh, small variation, variations of the, the text, the, the input text to map uh, different FOBI or, or food on entities. Okay. All right. Well, I'll have a take a look at that. We, we created another tool called um, LexMapper, which we will talk about in the last tool session. Um, we're interested to see uh, how people are doing that. that um, Okay, thanks for that. Um, there's a question from Lily. Could you get a textual definition through that automatic method as well? So I, don't, I wonder if um, Paul has addressed that question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, moving on to, to um, ontology for nutritional studies and its future directions. Um, first question, Magali Weber. Apart from kefir, do you tend to include other microorganisms like lactic acid bacteria? And how will you relate to the taxonomy of these bacteria and their phenotypes? Okay, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, this was, a, let's say, a first uh, implementation of fixed uh, use case. We are uh, actually performing and doing uh, some sort of uh, uh, catalog of uh, fermented food. And uh, I mean, uh, in the future, we, um, we plan to include also other food and to connect them to the uh, bacteria species or taxa that, that are performing the, the fermentation or other interesting uh, transformation. As for phenotypes, uh, uh, we didn't really think about phenotypes of the taxa. The taxonomy, I think, can can be quite easily uh, connected using the NC, NCI taxonomy. We have the species, we have the all the information. Uh, but uh, and with this, I think I respond also to the next question, not to the other next question. Um, let's say. The interest uh, uh, it's in the taxonomy uh, of the microbial community performing fermentation, but I will say that uh, we will go more on the pathways uh, and genes, because uh, at the very end, the the, the fact the, what what is important here is not really the taxonomy, maybe, uh, but more uh, a focus on the function, so on the pathways, on the genes, and that also what we could uh, in some way connect to metagenomics data. Mm -hmm. So yes, we will include something and some other examples uh, in the, the next future, let's say. Uh, okay, so the next... Uh, uh, so yes, uh, uh, so do you think the link, to link the information in this ontology with the gut microbiome composition? Yes, uh, but I really don't know how. I mean, it is uh, something uh, uh, connecting, uh, uh, as our background is in data analysis, uh, in metagenomics, this is something we will uh, always tend to. So connecting uh, knowledge representation, graph knowledge representation, let's say, to the actual data, it's something that sooner or later we will try to do. But at the moment, I really don't well know how to do it. I, I would say that it would be more useful and more easy for uh, genes again, so for the metagenomics, because we could, for example, uh, have a metagenome of a of a certain uh, food uh, and to see the, the properties and to have information the fermentative potential 
for example, of this, uh, of this sample. Uh, the other thing uh, interesting in uh, including taxonomy or uh, genes is that uh, I think that by consuming a fermentation product, uh, um, you are consuming not only the <clears throat> food component, uh, transformed or not, but you are also consuming some uh, live organism that can, uh, in some extent, uh, uh, be still. Uh, uh, vital and active uh, in uh, your gut. So this is something that uh, deserves to be modeled in some ways. Uh, yeah. Then there are comments on by Damien. I think that I, I, I did I let's say answered the, the first three the first three questions because they were more or less connected I would say to each other. Yes. Yes, I, um, I'm just very interested to see how more specialized knowledge um, is created by um, ontologies like ONS and that. Um, so it's, a, it's creating a frontier soon where we'll be able to query across outside of one ontology into others. Um, just a general comment. <clears throat> yeah, in the, in the case of lactose intolerance, um, I would say that now we don't have a model for this. I mean, I in, in this example, I simply I wanted to draft the idea that the the, the instance of concentration of lactose in kefir will be connected to to something uh, related to the lactose intolerance, but I don't really have a model for that. Okay, and. Um, I just had one more question for you, which was, um, was it difficult to actually uh, try to understand how to <clears throat> take your ONS ideas and uh, learn about all the different obo foundry family and BFO basic formal ontology elements um, that mirrored what you wanted to do or represent? Uh, was that like a two-year learning process, or, or uh, did you find a particular resource that was perfect for you? Well, I would say that the very first uh, draft schema of uh, the ONS uh, was not uh, based upon uh, uh, the Obo Foundry or the BFO. Uh, it was rather an organization of term, let's say, in a, in more, uh, in a more uh, IoT way, let's say. Um, when we encountered and stumbled upon the obofoundry and, B and the BFO, I must be, uh, I, in my opinion, it was uh, easier for me to model, uh, uh, um, to model the, those idea and those uh, concept with uh, the, the use of the obofoundry and the BFO and that uh, schema. Mm. For me, it was easier. And there is uh, a lot of material out there. It was, I don't have a background in computer science, so it was a, a couple of years, let's say, learning progress process, but there are a lot of, uh, of uh, presentation, for example, uh, there are some videos I remember from, uh, from Barry Smith on the use of BFO. There are example, uh, uh, there are uh, slide uh, out there, uh, in slide share uh, on various facets of ontology. I have a wonderful interaction with you in the first uh, uh, part uh, for the, uh, the inclusion of food on terms. So there is quite a lot of information out there. Okay, great. Uh, so my one fear is that people confronted with BFO or will found that you get a little bit overwhelmed at the um, <laughs> possibilities, but that's, that's good to hear. I, in my opinion, it was uh, uh, something which was easier than what uh, we initially done, let's say. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, um, then on to um, ontology for nutritional epidemiology, Chen. Um, question yeah. here. Um, in fact, if Lauren Van Roijen is online, uh, maybe you could pitch the question yourself. Um, Okay, yeah, I can see all the questions, the two questions. Okay, so regarding the, the first question about uh, 
uh, about uh, the metadata need to be captured in this area. Uh, I just checked with my with my supervisor, with uh, Professor Karl Aschott, and uh, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, now we are only focusing on the observational studies, and uh, that 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 means we are doing a data assessment. We collect data about uh, 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 data intake, what people eat. Maybe there would be a relationship between the, the, the gut status and uh, what people eat, but currently it's not all what we are focusing on. However, we are also uh, collecting omics data uh, from now on. So, we, it, but I have to say we are not experienced in this field. So collaboration and cooperation are very welcome towards mm -hmm. this question. Okay, and uh, for the second question about the natural language processing and machine learning technologies, uh, currently we, you, because we, uh, we extract information from the XML file of, uh, of uh, scientific articles. So uh, as you know, the XML, XML file are really structured, uh, uh, are really structured. They can provide structured information. So we we are we were coding to uh, to capture all the relevant information according to the to the XML uh, according to the structure uh, of the XM, of XML file because different journals they provide different kinds of structures and um, is uh, it would be easier if we can just use the structure of different journals. But at the same time, we also you uh, we are also trying to collect uh, uh, training material uh, regarding the uh, regarding uh, the development of knowledge graph. We are collecting uh, training material. That means we ask people to annotate their studies and uh, uh, data set uh, based, uh, uh, with our ontology. And uh, after we have. Uh, all the training materials so we are choose different uh, we'll choose a language uh, natural language processing and machine learning method to train our model and to see how we can continue in the field to, to fully automate the whole process but uh, currently we use uh, the structure of the xm file and to do the matching to um, uh, but later this is our current plan we are collecting the training material and uh, we will have the model in the near future Thank you. So Chen, I'm curious, the, um, obviously your, one, one of your tools shows the visualizations uh, documenting how much a particular paper, um, I can't remember the exact parameters, but rating sort of um, each paper on, on the presence of certain metadata uh, about the study, if I'm getting that right. Yes. Uh -huh. So, is this sort of leading to um, the ability to define? I mean, it is leading to an ability to define a standard about what uh, a paper should offer, um, a bit of an authoritative standard. So, is this? Do you envision your tools uh, in that particular regard as um, kind of a one-stop web shop where uh, an investigator can send their paper in and uh, see? which parts of the metadata standard they've they've succeeded at and which they, they need to do more work on yes this is uh, uh i'm not sure whether i understand uh, this question quite uh 100 uh, correctly 100 percent correctly but um i think uh we are currently we uh send emails to the authors and ask them to annotate their paper and the, mm -hmm. Yes, but uh, in, we are also going to uh, create like a online platform to collect those kinds of uh, uh, data. I mean, to to ask people to 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 annotate their paper online to fill in some information. And uh, actually, this is uh, we we are a group to 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 uh, to develop standards for uh, the reporting of uh, of uh, nutrition. Uh, no epidemiological research. And I totally agree with you for the people that uh, 
who are making standards, I mean, they, it, there is a chance to, I mean, I mean, for the people who who making the reporting guidelines uh, for different kinds of for nutrition research, it, there is a chance. I mean, to to convert those standards into uh, ontology and to let more people to uh, annotate their paper according to ontology, and it will fi finally ease the share of and the reuse of uh, the conclusions, the knowledge, the information, the study design, everything about uh, the. Uh, nutrition research manuscripts. Hmm. One last question from my department comes to mind, which is um, there are existing government driven um, nutritional research, uh, food, food intake surveys, such as we were, what we eat in America. Uh, do you have a, a target as well of sort of understanding what those standards or processes are um, so that data coming out of them is also um, exposed in a fair data way. Yes, yes. Um, I think it would be a very nice uh, suggestion for us. Uh, we have experience uh, regarding the uh, uh, data, data collection, and uh, we now we have experience about uh, those uh, the surveys and those questionnaires, the methods. So. As the next step, I think we would like to involve ONE uh, in this regard to try to um, finalize or no, try to standardize the, the part of the ontology regarding the surveys, the different kinds of surveys, and to see how we can really standardize this field to help manage different kinds of surveys with uh, clear classifications and uh, standardize the classifications. Yes. Great. Thank you. Well, at this point, I'm going to open it up to the floor. Um, anybody have um, topics they would like to raise? Um, this isn't just questions pitched at particular people, but um, overall, uh, overall issues uh, that the ontology, the food ontology domain needs to address within metabolomics. If you have no burning questions right now, I can just put in a plug for the um, the uh, GitHub working group where people within a cluster of ontologies, food-related ontologies, are adding uh, issues. Uh, and this is actually helping to scope out a bit the domain space between ontologies. <clears throat> um, so the issues can range from things like creating a recipe model to um, working on the dietary terms um, and yeah so i'll just promote that that can be a great place to uh, to pitch to the community as well okay i'll just give it a, just a little bit more time Anybody else wants to bring something up here? Otherwise, I think we're in a position to uh, to wrap up the meeting. Damien? Yes, Matthew. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, it's for you. Ooh. Since you are the organizer of all of these fine people and wonderful presentations, uh, I'm wondering, what is your grand vision for uh, how you see all of these ontologies integrating together and, um, you know, potential for um, products that could come as a result when, uh, when we have an interoperable uh, uh, farm or field to farm to uh, processing, to fork, to, well, essentially fertilizer <laughs> after it comes out of the body. Yeah. Um, what, what do you see? Right, uh, well, I know, I know Matthew, your, uh, your current interest is in knowledge graphs. And uh, so 
what is fascinating for me to see is that where food on my just itself focus on uh, organism times uh, anatomical part uh, as a as a, the beginning of the product food product um, domain food on one cover leading to um, multi component foods. I know that's food on's domain, but what I'm seeing is all of these other ontologies taking up the rest of that dirt to fertilizer um, panorama and to see the models come in play into place um, is wonderful and that would support this knowledge graph a more comprehensive queryable knowledge graph that you're talking about <clears throat> but to get there um, we need and this is why i'm so attracted to oboe foundry we need a smaller amount of data properties and object properties relations between things and uh, just a ton of classes beautifully architected classes that make all those distinctions in diet and uh, food and anatomy uh, that are just sitting there waiting to be described to that level of granularity and all of the can data. I, can I interrupt you there? Because you said something, and I'm not sure that everybody on the chat or call will um, appreciate your reasoning, but you said that there need to be fewer properties or relations in the relation ontology. Can you expand on your reasoning for that? Yeah, right now uh, there's a big, uh, <clears throat> you'll see this when you go out into the world, there's a big, uh, uh, there's a lot of do-it-yourself ontologies and they're inventing their own object relations and data properties left and right. <clears throat> and so then when you bring those data sets that are described by them into um, Wikidata and other RDF-based uh, graph um, uh, or graph engines, graph databases, people are left having to understand each and every relationship to know and the, and the term and the code to know if that's what they're interested in, if that's what they're after. So the whole mission with Oboe Foundry is to turn away from um, people having to learn as they want to go and do multidisciplinary searches across different domains, whether it's food, chemistry, biology, uh, genomics. We want to enable them to be able to learn a lesser vocabulary that won't take them years and years <laughs> in order to answer their questions. So sort of like coming up with Esperanto um, of the uh, ontology world. And so that's what I view Oboe Foundry is trying to do. So if you go, there, there's, there's a few things going on in Oboe Foundry that people probably want to know about. Um, the Oboe Foundry folks have tried to encourage everybody to use the RO relation ontology. Um, and that's why when you come to process modeling or uh, parthood, Mariology, uh, you'll get a small stock of relationships, uh, member of, part of, uh, proper part of, uh, you'll get a smaller set of process terminology, you'll get a process having an input and having an output and then being able to attach a role to that input so that um, so that uh, regent is uh, identified as one of the inputs to a process and so on. So there's this language that is meant to, um, if everybody buys into it, enables you to only be able to learn less to create the queries that would allow you to navigate the knowledge graph that would be uh, composed when you throw together all of these data sets that are encoded um, or annotated by ontology terms. The option, the alternative universe is the one that is kind of exhibited right now in, in Wikidata. Uh, there are over six, there are over 7,000 object and data properties that you might, might need to know. Do you know, if you need to know them? Well, you, <laughs> you have to go and look in their dictionary to see which ones are relevant uh, to your mission in order to start to be able to create the queries that, um, uh, that navigate that knowledge graph. So that's my so, uh, rant <laughs> about no, that. No, that's great. That's great. And I think that's helpful for a lot of people here. Uh, yeah. I'm just curious then, but 
some of these properties uh, may allow for a more refined search uh, or, and discovery than the broader terms. And I'll, I'll just give a for instance, and, and maybe you could opine on, um, you know, the difference between having a flat or relatively flat relation ontology and a hierarchical relation ontology. So if I'm looking inside of milk and um, I'm maybe looking for specifically oligosaccharides, um, why would I want to use a, a, a relation like contains um, and then have to search through all of the molecules instead of having a hierarchical version of the relation ontology where a subclass of contains might say contains oligosaccharide or contains bioactive peptide. Yeah, so um, if there's, there's a way of mapping both worlds and of course right. people are engaged in that. I can just say that um, in terms of that example you just gave, uh, I can write a query that says, uh, give me any milk product uh, data that contains, and then the class oligosaccharide. And that's achieved the same right. goal of having a property called has ugly oligosaccharide, and then some oligosaccharide. Right. So the, the object property has oligosaccharide might have a domain and range constriction that really helps um, uh, sort of clean, ensure clean data, but it's actually not right. doing anything different than just saying the word oligosaccharide, offering a class oligosaccharide in the object, um, object part of that uh, triple. Great. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of me not having to know oligosaccharide. Oh, ah, so uh, now <laughs> somebody has tried to raise their hand, and I'm not sure why, because some people have hands, and I totally forgot about hands, folks. I'm sorry. I'm, I was the kid who never raised my hand. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to uh, go back and now um, look at these hands that are raised. And so I'm going to start from the top, unless you have anything else to comment, Matthew. No, 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 no. I, I, I just thought that was uh, an important uh, point there. Okay. And so, I wanted to hear from you. Great. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you for getting that started. So um, I am trying to unmute Aisha Yulin. Um, Hi. You... Yes. Uh, this is Asia Yulin from FDA, but I'm not from the CIFSAN. I'm from CDRH. So I was asking a similar question as Matthew, actually. I heard a couple of talk. Uh, presenters say that we need to uh, harmonize the various food ontologies, and I'm I'm wondering, is there any uh, actual steps that will be taken to really harmonize different ontologies? And that's related to what just being discussed um, about. Um, to uh, establish as uh, less relations or smaller ontologies as possible, then in the future we will have uh, more interoperabilities. Uh, however, the reality is always different. So I, I, I just want to see uh, what is uh, what is the current thinking for now. Thank you. Great. Uh, I can offer a prime example. Um, so this spring, or actually in the fall, uh, some requests came in for dietary terms uh, to Food On um, through the Food On Issues Board. And I was willing to just take these in, but I wanted to throw them out for discussion. And already um, we were getting a couple of different ontologies that were interested in uh, nutrition space and also interested in phobe. I mean, uh, in uh, Oval Foundry. So the issue discussion that started on food on um, quickly had a, a number of other participants also meeting diet terms. 
and that uh, called for a, a teleconference in which we all got together to talk about those dietary terms. And then we realized we needed a sort of joint ontology work group site to, um, to discuss them. And ultimately, um, the discussion led to deciding to take those different requests for diet terms and put it in the ONS. So um, uh, Francesco has done some great work in creating an owl file now where they all sit. Um, and now each one of the ontologies that wants diet terms can actually draw from ONS for those diet terms. And that's what Foodon's going to do. We're going to bring in all our diet terms now from ONS as soon as that's in place, which sounds like it's just weeks away. So I'm anticipating the same process happening for other subdomains of language or vocabulary, um, including the recipe model, um, offering it into the community, getting feedback uh, through issues and teleconferences, and then being able to um, identify which ontology it best fits in so that then the remaining community ontologies can now import. And it's called the Mirio principle that the Oval Foundry really promotes, not duplicating uh, term uh, semantics and uh, identifiers, but rather uh, deprecating one's own in case there is a duplicate and identifying the best ontology to, to uh, retrieve that term from. Uh, that said, um, each ontology has its domain specific uh, needs and sometimes those do merit uh, a duplicate term with slightly different semantics. But what we do want to do in that case within the Oboe Foundry community is um, make sure the label of the term kind of mentions the semantics or conveys the semantics somehow of um, of the variation um, of the term that you find you need for your domain. Does that answer, um, Aisha? Does that help answer? Yeah. So actually, I, I can be a user of the of your. I, I'm I'm not sure. So do you include the herbs? In herbs. The food is herbal food. Botanicals, or maybe this touches really on botanicals. Um, mm -hmm. So okay. the next the next um, workshop is called uh, you know food in the agency. And um, one of the presenters there is going to be talking a bit about botanicals and how they aren't really covered very well in Food On, uh, and how there are some other non ontology resources out there that do cover botanicals better. So that would be one of the development projects to try to get uh, botanicals better represented either in Food On directly or in a standalone ontology if, uh, if there's enough of a community for it. Um, I think, uh, Damien, yep. Yeah. Has there and maybe maybe this is a, a good question for the group, but it seems like, uh, and the herbs are a good example, that there needs to be a uh, an, uh, a gap analysis done across uh, ag food diet health um, to say where. Do we have ontologies that people are working on? Where do we have gaps? And um, who would be the best people to work on those gaps? And uh, whatnot, or or you know, and and start sort of slicing up domains and noting uh, where things might live or uh, be developed. Yeah. And I, I know from past work, you, you uh, through IC Foods, you were making a, uh, quite an initiative to try to spreadsheet that. Um, I guess I've witnessed that it's been done a little bit more informally um, in this integrated food ontology workshop. Yeah. I, I guess, I think what's going on there is uh, each of us, whether it's workload or um, just domain of interest, haven't really had the mandate to go wide on that project, <laughs> the gap analysis, um, but rather just trying to figure out what we each need of the other uh, in, in, in the ontology area. So I would certainly welcome what you're talking about. Um, and the herb, the herb um, or botanicals is an example of that. Um, I think it was 
Liliana Ibnescu, if I'm not mistaken, um, who um, mentioned to me that um, the only source of botanicals right now is a printed in PDF um, <laughs> dictionary uh, that's that's well known in the U.S. Uh, for example. So that's the prime example of a gap analysis result. Right. I, I was also thinking things like uh, lining up with various um, food safety, FISMA things at FDA mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, uh, yeah. as well as uh, food identities uh, in the Codex Alimentaris uh, mm -hmm. and these various other projects. Yeah. So next week in the agency, um, there's going to be a few more presentations uh, by folks from the FDA and the USDA talking about vocabulary coverage for uh, their needs, specifically uh, a food package that's added on to uh, MIXIS standards, the Genome Consortium MIXIS standards for uh, biosamples, food-related food biosamples. So that'll, that kind of touches as well on um, their experience of trying to comb through uh, Oval Foundry and other ontologies to find the vocabulary to satisfy their needs. Um, so there'll be a bit of gap analysis discussion then. Awesome. So I have another hand up, uh, Francesco Capozzi, so unmuting you. Okay. Could you hear me? Yes. Okay. Nice to meet you all. I'm Francesco from Italy. I'm uh, working uh, for a while with uh, Francesco Vitali huh? and uh, Rosario. We were uh, working on, uh, on a paper that you mentioned also. I'm a chair of uh, Foodomics, a conference uh, held by, let's say, 229. So it's uh, almost uh, 12 years that we are trying to put together different domains. I'm a user of, uh, of course, of databases and uh, I would like also to contribute to the definition of uh, ontologies for uh, databases. And this is why I hope that I'm not off topic, but uh, since you are talking about gap analysis, uh, probably my uh, opinion could also be in some way interesting to you. If you are an expert, you are uh, working directly on this, on this matter. So I'm not expert of databases, but I'm expert of uh, food. I'm a food chemist. I'm, uh, I'm a, a, a structural chemist. So my contribution could be in this discussion is about, uh, I'm also a nutrimetabolomist, let's say, by, by the way. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on uh, metabolomics uh, uh, related to nutritional studies. And uh, uh, my first, my first, uh, I have three, three uh, inputs for you. And one is, uh, and it's uh, a question, so it's something that I would like to, to capture your in interest. This is very important for me and for my future uh, work. Uh, so one is, uh, what is the, in your opinion, the possibility that uh, databases and, uh, and uh, let's say also some kind of, uh, of a quality check in the in the uh, in the ontologies that we are using could help to uh, could help to uh, check for the reliability of nutritional questionnaires because this is uh, really a, let's say a, a problem a really a problem in uh, in uh, in filling in uh, with data databases uh, with nutritional information about the dietary uh, information, let's say. So uh, we, we are looking for uh, biomarkers of consumption and there is a lot of uh, inconsistency between the data and, uh, and uh, what we look in, uh, in, uh, in bodies, in uh, human bodies. The second one is uh, how about uh, we can go, we can go after uh, food composition and so uh, food structure beyond beyond food composition because we are talking about food like the solutions like homogeneous solutions but food are all but homogeneous so 
food structure is very important. And uh, I don't know if someone has tackled the possibility to describe food with descriptors. And so the relative ontologies related to the, uh, to the food structure is uh, implemented in some way somewhere. And so it is very important because, as you may uh, imagine, uh, there is a lot of uh, interaction between structure and uh, bioavailability of uh, nutrients and uh, bioactive compounds. And uh, last but not least, is, uh, is it possible to consider meals as a whole and not just uh, making uh, uh, data mining and, uh, let's say, uh, text mining to uh, de uh, deconvolute? recipes in a single in single uh, in single uh, elements in single uh, food uh, components and then miss the overall meal composition which is uh, very important because interaction between uh, foods in a meal is very important i hope that i can I contribute it in the right way and in the right place right okay so i clearly got your last one um the notion that um food components on a plate and even at the same time, or even within a certain time frame, could possibly affect each other. And that that becomes one of the variables in nutritional analysis um, that one might be able to tease apart if you have data described um, to that level um, of, of um, a food diet log in which uh, you can actually mark off uh, when people ate parts of the meal <clears throat> or what the parts were. So I think um, just on that one, we're heading in the direction you wanna go in terms of these uh, standards around keeping data for the um, dietary consumption logs. Um, going to the food composition, uh, I, that's, that sounds like a great um, uh, subdomain and I don't have anything to offer about that. I don't know if anyone else does. Um, uh, I'm wondering if there's a way just to open up talk so that people don't have to raise their hands. Uh, I'm not seeing it at the moment, but... Um, All folks I, have to do is unmute. Unmute. Okay, good. Good. So if somebody has a uh, response to that, um, let me know. Or tell us all. <laughs> Uh, it does sound like a, a nice um, subdomain to really look at food structure. And then, um, as to the first question, I didn't actually quite catch. Um, I heard biomarkers of consumption, but I actually literally didn't catch um, what it was you were um, needing. Uh, uh, the sorry, it means that uh, uh, usually we, we work uh, for uh, uh, nutritional studies, we work on inputs like data from uh, questionnaires, for example, from uh, uh -huh. uh, from uh, HR uh, 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 24 hours record or for uh, frequency food uh, consumption data based on questionnaires. So uh, there is a, a strong uh, um, uh, bias uh, due to the uh, to the perception of consumers of uh, interventions to make a, a correct uh, description of what they had. And so uh, um, I think that, uh, that a, big, a big problem will be, and this is uh, uh, of course uh, uh, highlighted by the presence of uh, studies about uh, uh, biomarkers of consumption, which are not uh, uh, making uh, so many consistency uh, proof of uh, what is uh, declared, what is uh, written in the in, uh, in the questionnaire and what is the actual consumption. So there is a gap between uh, the actual consumption and the, and, the, and the perceived consumption by consumers and the so written. And so I, 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 would, uh, I wonder if uh, we could, uh, we could uh, uh, exploit, uh, let's say, uh, tools within uh, databases uh, that make some quality check for the consistency of what is declared uh, what is uh, uh, in the input as a data and what is the effective uh, uh, relationship with the, with the effect of this input. And, uh, okay. So, for example, uh, if people are entering what they ate free form, 
double checking that the questionnaires that aren't asking free form questions uh, actually mention the same possible possibilities of or, 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 or camouflaging uh, the same question in a different way to, to ah, yes and so to make a relationship between uh, uh, between answers right uh, would be and uh, the other question is related to the fact that you say someone told uh, about the the uh, the let's say the connector uh, I, I think it's called connector when you say contained in no so uh, the, the word containing means that uh, a chemical is uh, in a food uh, but there is no information about how this is contained in, in which relationship we have I mean, uh, sovereign molecular relationship with other chemicals within the food. So other than uh, containing, mm -hmm. there is any other connector between uh, uh, composition and food? Uh, right. And the classic example of that is, yes, baking soda is an ingredient in muffins, but there isn't any such substance usually <laughs> in the end after you bake them. <laughs> so that kind of ambiguity about what's actually in something. Okay, okay. I get that. And Thank you very much. one of the ONS folks had any commentary on that being in the yeah, survey. If I, if I may add, uh, I think that uh, Francesco is uh, pointing towards uh, uh, understanding, uh, method to understand, let's say, uh, to model uh, if a substance contained in uh, the food, it's uh, bioavailable. So can, uh, in the very end, uh, uh, reach the, the bloodstreams uh, or be used by the uh, by the metabolism. I think this is what uh, Francesco was uh, was aiming at. Gotcha. As for the quality, I will say that uh, the work made by in ONE uh, by Chen uh, with the quality descriptor uh, could be the way of uh, having more uh, uh, let's say higher quality questionnaire because having uh, free form text maybe it's not the best because you can't control i think at least uh what the the, 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 the patients or the participant is uh, is responding mm -hmm. yeah Two this is a, like uh, those one yeah sorry no go ahead i was finished and then yeah, but I, I, I finished basically was that uh, the, the questionnaire, uh, um, let's say developing more uh, ontologically question and maybe effective and useful because uh, you can clearly control the, uh, the word that are in, uh, given as a response. Yeah, okay, this is uh, Anna Maria, I'm not really in the food ontology because I'm more on the biomedical uh, ontology develop, but I was, um, I think it's really interesting the, the point of uh, describing the food component that Francesco brought up and, and trying to capture whatever is possible, whatever they are information, which kind of uh, uh, chemical transformation will happen to the food, uh, you know, to the component when mixed with other components. And uh, I think capturing that will be really important even to uh, then maybe link to, uh, you know, toxic effect, allergy and something else. So uh, if there are information, and uh, as I say, I'm out of the food <laughs> um, um, domain, uh, I think it will be really interesting to have that. It's kind of, uh, you know, uh, going on the chemical uh, process of the component in, when you add in the food. Mm -hmm. uh, being not being a chemist, biochemist, or um, a, uh, a metabolomics person, um, I am leaving it to that community of ontologists to uh, take that further. Um, but I can definitely see how. Um, Identifying this is probably calling for um, uh, for a call uh, within our integrated food ontology workshop on this on this topic of um, of survey data and then the um, molecular level of representation that needs to happen. Um, I, it's Matthew. I'm just going to jump in for a quick comment here uh, on two things. 
one being the survey and the other being the food structure. Um, I think the survey thing uh, is going to be very difficult because uh, we talk about portioning and allotments and meal types that range from snacking to a meal and, and anybody who can define the difference between a snack and a meal. Um, you know, I'll give you kudos, but it's going to be different depending on what culture you're in. And so there's going to be a need on this particular level to uh, survey the folksonomies, uh, the, that is the, the vocabularies of different groups from different cultures and the words that they use to describe how they themselves eat. Uh, and that's going to be important if you want to be able to capture closed fields as opposed to open-ended questions. Um, regarding the food structure thing, uh, your baking soda example was good, Damien, but there's other examples that are really important, like um, the oxidation state of a mineral, for instance. Um, the oxidation state of iron in meat uh, and the oxidation state of iron in uncooked broccoli make a difference in how the iron is absorbed in the body. Um, similarly, uh, if you look at ice cream, uh, the uh, crystalline structure of the fat in the ice cream will determine whether the ice cream is hard or soft and may not actually change. I mean, it's, it's, there, there's no difference in the actual composition of the food in terms of the molecules that are there. Uh, but there's a very big difference in the sensory characteristics and that then has an impact on how much or how frequently someone might eat it. Yeah, research on that is already going on, I take it. Um, it's just not being done particularly within the ontology modeling context. Hi, this is Sande. I'm not sure if you saw that I raised my hand, Damien. I, I don't no. want to waste anyone's time past the, past the time allocated for this, so I'm just going to jump in and quickly ask my question. I was really excited about hearing um, the vocabulary and modeling harmonization efforts um, among these ontologies, and I know that the Obel Foundry comes with a set of guidelines of its own. Um, I don't know if I, I, I also um, enjoyed really uh, very much hearing about the automated methods uh, that, that people are using for pulling these vocabularies. Um, my question is, are we in agreement on building strategies or methodologies um, for these ontologies or design patterns so that once these ontologies are built, they're, they, they're concordant, they play well with each other and uh, especially in the back of the back end of an AI or machine learning um, tool. So I'm just wondering if there's an agreement on the, the structure of these ontologies that it were. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to address that? I'll just, uh, first of all, that's a little, in a sense, that's a little bit of a plug for um, the workshop that Handy is going to chair. <laughs> at the end of it. Uh, because uh, that workshop is about ontology tools and building. Um, and there are a few presentations on, uh, on uh, actually comparing two ontologies. Uh, there's one presentation on that. There's one on, um, on the, um, guidelines for building an ontology um, 
from one, one framework and, and so on. So I expect more discussion in, in her term, in her term on that, but I'll just say it's my bias that uh, the reason I was attracted to Oba Foundry is that it was providing a framework for interoperability of uh, ontology development. What I'm turning to machine language for is um, recommendation systems to say what classes might belong under what classes having mind uh, free text and, and other uh, work out there as well. So I, I see that's how they would influence the development of ontology. And then of course, machine learning has the advantage in actually making sense of the data annotated by ontology and is helped by having um, categorical variables spelled out, um, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Now, I, you're right, maybe this is kind of a, a teaser a, uh, for, the, for the next sessions to come, but I think it's important to kind of think about the structure of the ontologies um, as we're developing them so they, they can um, work together when time comes for that. Um, and yeah, so um, this was really great. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, I knew that. I'll just put a slight side plug. If you really want to test how your ontology is fitting into Oboe Foundry, try, if you haven't already, import the BFO ontology and figure out where your terms fit underneath that, and then hit the reason button and see if there are any contradictions. Um, that's sort of a basic test. Okay, uh, with that, I think uh, it's a good time to close the session and I really thank all of you for participating and uh, making this really exciting. Yeah, so look forward to more discussion in the coming workshops and over on the Integrated Food Ontology Workshop, uh, hit up. So thanks very much and um, we'll see you next week, hopefully. Thanks for organizing, Damien. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, bye. Thank bye, you. bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you very much for this very nice uh, workshop. Very impressive. Thank you very much. Okay, good to hear. Thanks, Daniel. Bye. Mm -hmm. Adios. <laughs>